everyone. I'm Sabine van der Linden. Today, I'm going to meet with Mark McLaughlin. Mark is an IBM executive. He's a global insurance director for IBM, but also IBM Industry Academic member. Today, we'll be talking about a number of topics. We'll cover who is Mark, Mark Parties for Growth, a new concept called risk experience, and then we we'll look at the future of insurance, whether it's about tech, always about business models. Hi everyone, today I have the great pleasure to be with Mark McLaughlin from IBM, executive insurtech and insurance expert. And we are going to cover today, how can we leverage policyholders, users, customer experience to drive unique journeys. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Sabine. I'm uh, glad to join you today. This will be fun. So it should be a lot of fun and should be highly entertaining, I hope, and instructive too for our listeners. And I want to start our conversation with who you are. Who is Mark? <laughs> well, uh, you know, from a professional standpoint, uh, I lead a strategy from the insurance vertical for IBM. Uh, we'll pull together our hardware, our software, our cloud, our services, and our business partners, many of whom are insurtechs, to solve insurance problems, right? You know, we don't talk about MIPS or throughput or, you know, training times. We talk about claims and underwriting and policy administration. So, um, been doing that for a long time uh, in a number of different contexts, uh, you know, uh, working in the insurance industry for uh, 20 plus years. Let's just leave it at that. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the first systems that I programmed were uh, back uh, in the 90s uh, doing AI for uh, underwriting, uh, got to automated underwriting 95%. And they're still running today. So, uh, you know, that tells you something about the industry or something about my coding skills, probably, probably more than former. Um, you know, that's it. You remember you said you were doing AI for underwriting and I remember, you know, I work with IBM too. We used to do a lot of predictive analytics, right? Advanced analytics in the time and helping insurers with underwriting and claims to try to automate and actually do what we call at the time less best actions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I, I, during the dot-com years, I ran a CRM consultancy and, and that idea of sort of what's the right next thing to do that will maximize my value to the customer and in turn the, the, the customer's value to me that's a space that's that's been of interest to me for a long time so i actually uh you know do, do a fair amount uh, not just in claims and underwriting but out and out in the distribution of marketing spaces as well mark why ibm so what brought you to this amazing can i say amazing giant <laughs> Um, you know, IBM, I, I, I think, um, you know, has a pedigree of uh, innovation, you know, that's been built over many years. Um, IBM Research is, is one of the great research institutions in the world. Um, growing up in suburban New Jersey, I actually interned at Bell Labs uh, back uh, when that was a big uh, innovation center around the world. Uh, you know, I think they've, they've turned it into some, some other company now. But um, that idea of, of taking innovation and, and, and deploying that in, in ways that are helpful to individuals, that are helpful to society, that are helpful to solving real problems around risk, um, you know, that's that's an area that's very exciting to me. And, you know, those are the types of solutions that I've worked on in my IBM career and, and, and in stuff previously. You know, one of my most amazing memory is when I used to go to the IBM training in New York and New Jersey. And uh, you have this amazing building over there and you have all the scientists and the whole history of IBM. And I used to walk through, you know, looking at the momentous um, around the campus. And I have those amazing memories to meet the scientists and the educate, educators, right, uh, in the building and their passion for the technology and also for uh, the education they gave us as employee at the time. Uh, that uh, that technology investment, you know, it pays off in, in in odd ways sometimes, right? You know, research, you know, sometimes takes on these things that are five and ten years out, right? And quantum is a good example of 
of that investment right now. But Watson, that one time was, you know, that same sort of, you know, 10 year moonshot uh, type investment. And, you know, just being able to show clients, you know, the, the, the set for the IBM Jeopardy appearance, you know, with Watson was, you know, it was a really exciting thing to do. And, and then coming back and saying, how does that apply to solving a risk problem for an end insured at an insurance company? Right. You know, I, I, that blending of sort of the, the the blue sky research and the practical is is something that uh, you know I, I find personally very interesting and is something that IBM does pretty well. So moving from you know the background, I would love for you to tell us what are your most memorable events of the past eighteen months. Yeah. <laughs> well, as with everybody, you know, COVID uh, right off the top of the bat and, and, and just, um, you know, doing what I do, I, I, I have a worldwide remit. So I'm used to flying 300,000 miles a year. And that all came crashing to a halt for me like it did for everybody else, you know, around about uh, February of, of, of 2020. And, um, you know, it was really it's been a, it's been a long, strange trip these last 18 months being at home. Um, you know, my wife has not changed the locks on the door yet. So, so, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't outworn my welcome here, but, uh, um, you know, quality, this weird mix of really great quality time with my family and my children. Um, but, but also missing that face-to-face -face client interaction, uh, that face-to-face, -face, you know, whiteboarding and solving business problems and coming up with new ways to sort of get all that done has, has been a, you know, a, a sort of a, a professional challenge. IBMers are used to working from home and working remotely. We've we've been that way for years. But watching our clients, you know, who who might not have always been quite so used to that, evolve their thinking and say, "Hey, you know, it's okay to to, to have a discussion online. It's okay to make a decision on an RFP. It's okay to to, to research technology in these ways." Right, that's permanently changed business, and and I think those effects are going to reverberate not just you know in the business side, but in in, in you know you know with all the insurance customers that we serve as as an industry. Um, you know, the other big event, <laughs> you know, aside from interminable Zoom calls, right? Um, you know, is is coming back. Um, I was just at ITC. I I, I know, Sabine. You know, given your location, that was a challenge for you. I know. So, I could not go. Um, so tell me, you know, how was that? States, it, was, it was a little easier, and uh, you know, that was my first trip. Uh, you know, since since COVID started for business, and you know, to just re re you know, see people again, reestablish and, and renew relationships and conversations with colleagues I've worked with in some cases for many years, um, you know, is, is, is really exciting. And yet those interactions all change too, right? Now it's okay to say, Hey, you know what? Calendars aren't aligning, you know, let's, let's connect up via, you know, via Zoom or WebEx or whatever next week. Right. It, it's it, it, there's new business models that have sort of emerged out of it. Uh, and that was just, you know, wildly apparent, you know, sitting at ITC and, and watching all the interactions. So looking at this, how do you think what you've experienced just looking at ITC is impacting insurers customer experience and how they deal with their own customers? Well, I, you know, I, I think the. Um, when we first started going into COVID, um, we had a point of view, um, which, you know, I, I worked with some of my industry academy colleagues to sort of formulate around COVID and insurance. And, and our thought was this, there are insurers that were already investing in digital and relationships. And there are other insurers that were trying to figure out how to deploy laptops to their staff and trying to solve yeah. remote networking and security problems, right? They were, they were kind of caught on the basics, Absolutely. And, you know, no fault of their own. You know, this is a big, you know, big change for everybody. But those digital firms had a lead and COVID has helped them extend that lead. And, and further to that, I think that you can split the digital players into sort of two, two types, right? One is some insurers invested in digital, but basically, you know, used it as an alternative way to get the existing processes done, to sell the existing products, to, you know, to operate the existing um, claims and underwriting systems. But there's a subset of those digital insurers who use this time to reinvent, to rethink what insurance is, to get out of the paradigm of I'm going to prepare a, a actuarial 
based rated risk product with a fixed term and a fixed contract and you know in, in an illustration that's got to be sold by an agent to an end insured you know and and is very regimented and and, and rigorous right there's there's a class of insurer that has gone beyond that and said how can i rethink risk how can i rethink the risk product how can i rethink the risk experience and and those insurers i think are accelerating their lead right they're the ones who are going to be around 10 years from now when you know some of the other insurers that didn't start rethinking the risk product and 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 stuck with sort of the traditional products are going to find themselves in a very difficult spot because they're they're going to be commoditized they're going to be aggregated you know we've seen it in in different markets around the world that's only going to accelerate. Amazon's going to come after all of them. So, <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, it, it's 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 going to be, you know, it, you need you need that differentiation to to thrive. And if you don't have that differentiation, I would I would question your survival. So, knowing that you know, big tech, you mentioned Amazon is coming after you know insurance. Love to dive into your growth priorities and um, understand what you are looking at very closely right now to make choices around who you're working with and how you're growing your organization within IBM. Ah, okay. I mean, yeah, there's there's what insurers are doing to grow, and there's what we're doing to grow, right? I, 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 we are we are all about hybrid cloud and AI, right? Um, you know, Arvind uh, Krishna, our CEO, is really doubled down on that vision, saying that's that that is going to be IBM's bread and butter. That is going to be our claim to fame. We're going to help enterprises solve that problem. What does that mean, right? Hybrid cloud is the idea that you are going to have a mix of sources for innovation, sources for your compute power, sources for your operations. You're not all going to get to one single cloud. You are not going to get to, you know, a, a, a cell phone set of data centers. Everybody's well aware of that one, right? It's going to end up being a mix because you're going to want innovation from some other cloud. You're going to want to integrate an application that runs in some other environment. You're going to want to pull data from an ecosystem partner that might be, you know, an edge compute model where a lot of that data is living in a completely different system. And yet as an insurance company, I'm handling a lot of sensitive personal information. I am handling a high, there's a high degree of trust and reliability that is expected of insurers. And we are a tightly regulated industry. And so insurers are going to have to figure out how to mix. You know, I might have an environment or two of choice, but I'm probably going to have to have a mixed environment technically. How do I secure across that? How do I monitor across that? How do I connect quickly across all that? And how do I do that at speed? Because, you know, I, I may cut a deal with a telematics partner today or, a, you know, a, a, a distribution arrangement with a retailer today. I might have three more retailers tomorrow or the one I have might kick me to the curb and go, <laughs> go find somebody else. And I'm going to have to go rethink my retail strategy. Right. So, so I can't predict, you know, Hey, everybody's going to partner with X style of firm or everybody's going to pull this set of data. What I can predict is that those things are going to change over time as an insurance company, you need to be able to manage across that. And where IBM's plan is, is we are going to help companies manage that hybrid cloud complexity. We're going to help them deploy AI to simplify it and to automate it where it makes sense. And we're going to help use those tools to help the humans in the process, you know, really add the value where the humans should be adding the value, right? Don't fill out change of address forms, right? Build relationships with end insurers, right? And, and, and help guide them to risk decisions that, that are still going to be complex in this world, maybe even more complex, right? You are actually bringing quite a few items. So hybrid clouds, right? On-premise and off-premise. It means that businesses have flexibility, I guess, as to what they do. Mm -hmm. You also yep. covered the fact that we have to, to understand risk. We need to be able to um, understand how we do privacy and security um, in both areas, leveraging new technology like, such as artificial intelligence. And you also talk about augmented individual. Um, I think there is this new term around this um, human in the process thing where you actually, you know, need to mix artificial intelligence and people, which leads to, I think, some aspect of ethical AI. Can you actually go into a bit deeper around those three points, you know, hybrid and what that means 
from absolutely. So let's let's think about it from what an insurer is trying to do, and and you know you're you, you are as an insurer trying to engage with people on risk. You're you're having to do that digitally, which isn't just automating your old stuff or putting it on the web, right? It's now multiple channels, right? It's 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 social media, it's it's text and and uh, you know and, and and voice interaction. It is face to face, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of video calls, right? There's a lot of different interaction models and a lot of different players that you can have those conversations with. And you as an insurer are trying to figure out how to how to offer risk products and services in, in that environment. Right. Um, you're not going to monitor every one of those channels all the time. Right. You know, your average millennial, you know, if, <laughs> you know, Facebook's old hat email. What? You know, it's for old people. Right. You know, if you're not you're not <laughs> you're not out on Twitch and Twitter and, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, you're running a discord, you know, debate, you know, you're you're, you're probably behind the times. Right. So, you know, my kids think if it's not on YouTube, it doesn't exist. So I, I, I you have to figure out how to manage across all that as an insurance company. And you're going to pull in capabilities from, you know, marketing providers and, you know, data, data sources and different, different sources of content. And you're going to try and deploy all that, you know, across those channels. You need systems that are flexible. You need systems that are secure. You need systems that are interoperable. You, you, you can't say, well, all my stuff's on cloud X and yet this partner is on cloud Y, and, mm -hmm. you know, and without being able to interconnect across that. Um, being able to combine all that together into what I think of as sort of a new risk experience is, is ultimately where the battleground is going to be, right? Don't just sell me a product. Give me advice, right? Don't just give me advice. Give me advice that is tailored to what you know about me, right? If I am a 45-year-old, you know, mom who's got, you know, three kids in the back of a minivan, I react very differently than a 25-year-old sports car driver or, you know, or, you know, or a delivery truck driver, right? To advice, to product offers, to, you know, uh, to, 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 you know, help offers for help and how to avoid risks and, you know, driver coaching, all those things. So how do I as an insurer kind of combine all that mm -hmm. into a coherent experience that is tailored, right? I, I think that's where the, the really exciting part is. And then when, when I need a human to talk me through something, right? Do you engage that human seamlessly? Does the human know all the stuff that's gone on before in the conversation? Mm -hmm. Right. Does does the human make intelligent recommendations? Next best action. Right. You know, it's 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 it's, it's laying out, you know, it, it, I make it, 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 it's it's a much more holistic sort of model where we replicate sort of what goes on in an agent's head. But we do that in a variety of contexts. And, and by the way, we don't get rid of the agent when we do that. I'm not saying replace the agent. I'm saying the agent is your trusted advisor that is, you know, covering the ground behind all this. And when you've got a real, you know, complex problem, they're there to help you. And when you got something simple, you don't have to bug them, right? You know, you can you can do it online. You can do it with AI. You can do it via call center. You can do it at two in the morning. Right? That, that, those are sorts of models, I think, that will that'll come to the fore. So you're introducing an interesting new term, risk experience. So you've given us already some example. Can you dive into your definition of what risk experience means? I, I, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. So, um, you know, we are, and we're actually <laughs> about to release a study on uh, some of these concepts uh, shortly here, right? But, uh, um, you know, that risk experience is all about how do you help the customer through a risk conversation, help them uh, think about risk and help them take good actions that'll help them reduce their risk. And those actions might include buying a policy and it might include some other things. It's gotta be a much more holistic sort of thought, right? First off, you've gotta show up at the point of risk, right? You know, I. I I, I, I'm not thinking about insurance when, you know, my, my buddy, the insurance agent buttonholes me, you know, at the tennis club at lunch, right? I'm thinking about, you know, auto insurance when I'm buying a car. I'm thinking about pet insurance when I go and get a pet. I'm thinking about education savings when I have a baby, right? So how do insurers have visibility into when those things happen and have a seat at the table when those things happen, right? That, that, you know, bespeaks the need for ecosystems and partnerships, right? Insurers don't always have that seat front and center, but they can partner with those who do. Once you're there at that point of risk, help me think about the risk in a way that is relevant to me, right? Um, and help me think about how to reduce the risk, not how, what product you want to sell me, right? 
Um, when I buy a car, right, I'm going to need some kind of insurance on that car. And, and if you appeal to me emotionally about, you know, banging up your, your nice car, educate me a little bit about, you know, the depreciation as soon as it drives off the lot, right? Those are good conversations to have, but different people re, re, react to those conversations in different ways. And so, you know, you know, be at the point of risk, give advice and mitigation, not just sell a product and then tailor it to the customer situation and what you know about the customer because different customers react differently. That's a demographic thought. That's a psychographic thought. That's a situa risk situational thought. And then help me manage the risk, which might be, again, sell me a policy. It might be sell me some tools that will help me reduce my risk. It might be, you know, sell me some services that'll help manage risk, right? If I'm buying a new car at my age, right, you can probably assume I might have a teenage driver in the house, mm -hmm. right? Or at least you can check on that, right? You know, I, as a father of a teen driver, right, I, I would love <laughs> for my insurance company to help me manage that risk, right? You know, are there tools that'll help me keep an eye, you know, on when my son is, is driving at night? Are there policy options that'll help me? Um, encourage driving during the day versus driving at midnight, right? You know, you know, there's there's a ton of things that can be done, and that can be done in combination with auto manufacturers. It can be done in combination with sensors in the car. It can be done in you know in combination with sensors on the phone. So, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of interesting options if if insurers would would think about it as how do you help me reduce my risk instead of just how do I sell you a policy, right? Selling a policy should only be part of the conversation at all. Yeah, you are talking about outcome, benefit, results. So looking at the end goal, right, we all want to achieve and then embedding the insurance engagement within that. I mean, you already mentioned how this can be done differently. Is there any additional technology, capability, additional context we need to consider when we start looking at risk experience as part of, you mentioned, an ecosystem of things? Yeah, well, and it starts with ecosystems, right? Um, you know, are you able to deploy technology quickly to sort of build those connections as your marketers, as your product, you know, um, uh, you know, the definers, as your actuaries, sort of mull over how to how to cover a risk, right? You may you may strike up different partnerships for any of a number of reasons, right? It might be distribution, right? It might be capturing additional information. It might be being able to, to learn more about the customer so I can offer relevant advice. Um, it might be to help, you know, speed up remediation you know, of, of a claim, you know, or there, or there to be one, right? There's a lot of different partners that are adjacent to insurance, you know, and, and we, we've talked about, you know, OEM auto manufacturers and, and telematics device providers, but, you know, you can talk about you know the, the the financial aggregators. You know the the, the mints and the and the and the, uh, uh, the betterments of the world, right? Um, you can talk about you know financial savings, you know options, and and you know even even the colleges themselves, right? There's there's a lot of different partnerships you can envision that could help inform a risk experience. Can you set those things up quickly? Can you do those at speed? Can you maintain security and can you maintain, you know, the, the, the uptime and, the, and the failover and all the stuff that IT people worry about in terms of stability, right? Can you keep all those things operational? Um, you know, there, there's an architecture kind of behind that that I think is important to sort of consider. Um, you know, if, if you are reliant on a single cloud, you know, you are vulnerable. If you are reliant on a single core system, you are probably vulnerable, right? If you rely on a single CRM system, you may be vulnerable, right? You've got to figure out how to how to work across those systems to make sure that you offer a, a consistent experience and a and, and a um, and a tailored experience and an experience that's close to the point of risk for the customer. You know, Mark, I remember reading probably eight years ago a Gartner report saying, you know, we will all be working out of probably five minimum five cloud, uh, you know, cloud infrastructure, you know, for data like you know, being on um, a Dropbox and a box and uh, a Microsoft cloud and uh, Apple cloud. Absolutely. And, you know, today probably we have more than five, isn't it? And so that's- Our, number, our numbers, uh, last last study I saw was eight per insurer on, on average, so. So as you said, you, you do not, you cannot rely on one and then you have to manage the risk which lies around 
having so many technology endpoints to actually manage your customers? Well, and those, those technology endpoints, um, you know, there's the behavior we're seeing, you know, in a lot of the insurance marketplace today for IT services. Um, you know, I think a lot of, lot of folks don't necessarily quite appreciate the risk that they are undertaking. You know, there's there's a tendency to say, "Up, oh, I'm running on CloudX," and you know, they 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 say they've got this covered, right? But you read the you read the actual terms, and they say, "Well, we provide you the tools for you to cover it." That's a different thing, right? And then you got the insurance CIO or CTO saying, "Well, I'm gonna you know I'm I'm, I'm gonna go source this to you know a particular core insurance application provider." Up, oh, well, they've got an SLA, I'm covered, right? And and no one's kind of working through the process and saying. Are you really covered all the way across the board? Can you can you verify that that you know your data is not running afoul of GDPR? Can you verify that your data is destroyed when you know when you you yeah. you ask for it to be destroyed? Can you confirm that that data is locally housed? If your regulator pulls the data, you know calls for a data poll, can you do that cleanly and quickly? All of those issues, right? we've got this sort of daisy chain of, of cloud, you know, eight different clouds and, you know, a bunch of different core systems and a lot of different, you know, intertechs all kind of interacting together and, you know, a CIO or CTO is kind of riding herd over all of it. But do you have controls that are actually covering all of those spots and verifying that they are all actually running the security protocols that you think they are, right? Can you verify that when one system goes down that the other systems are managed okay. appropriately? Uh, you know, those are the sorts of things where, you know, having a, a good architecture kind of behind all this and then the right security, the right controls, the right open systems, you know, that that help you manage across that. I, that, that those become more important as insurers go down this path. Right. When you when you just had your own data center to worry about, you know, you kind of, you know, you can kind of kind of work it there. But in this new sort of multi cloud hybrid cloud world. Um, managing across that complexity becomes becomes pretty important and thinking through it from an architecture standpoint, um, you know, sounds really gorpy and boring to the business side. And yet that's the thing that's going to future proof you as an insurance company, because I got I got tons of insurers who come to me and say, I, Mark, I believe you in all the digital stuff. I, I'm, I'm trying to do risk experiences. I'm, I'm, I, I've drunk Kool-Aid. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not thinking products anymore. You know, I want to, I want to do all that. I got these partnerships in mind. Me and IT takes forever to do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and, and if you explain to them what their security vulnerability was while IT was taking a lot of time, they, they, they'd be horrified. Right. So, so it, it, it you know, it, it, there's a partnership between the insured and the end customer on risk experience. There's also a partnership between the business and the IT side of the insurance organization. And as insure techs, right, how do you connect into that? Now the insure techs are, you know, internally, you know, sort of trying to become post that, I think, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, they got to scale up fast enough and, and you know, and have real grown up security when they do that, right? That's, that's going to, that's, that's their journey. Right, the the end and you know, the, the the incumbent insurers, right, have got to figure out how to integrate all this together and to do so, um, you know, in a way that's that's reasonable. So, so you have much mentioned so many things, but that takes me into okay. So, what does it mean from from a a future of insurance viewpoint, Mark? You know, is it about tech? Is it about business models? You know, what do we do with all this stuff you've just mentioned to us? Business models first, tech second. The tech has to power the business models and the tech can enable some of those business models because I have access to IoT data and wearables data and, you know, uh, new space, you know, monitoring mm -hmm. of, of what's going on on the ground and, you know, financial payments flows from some of the fintech providers, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of data you can kind of pull into the, into the mix. Um, but the 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 future is really pulling those things together into sort of that coherent risk experience and being able to do that at speed and being able to do that at scale. It's 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 getting beyond I am gonna make my bread and butter. You know, you look at the the you know the, the, the Geico's and the progressives of the world, right? They they're 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 they are very quickly diversifying you know, their, their product offering, even if they have to get somebody else to underwrite some of it underneath, right? They don't care, right? They, they just, they know they got to get bigger, right? 
USAA has kind of known this for a while, right? Mm -hmm. They 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 offer you know uh, you know ten no. plus product lines, and you know they take it very seriously. If if you you know it's share a wallet is sort of what they think about, right? Yeah. It, it's it's not you know, and that's not a, a a profit statement. That's more a we failed in serving our customer if they're buying their stuff from somebody else. So we should you know we should we should we should work on that, right? So, but getting to that sort of holistic provider, I think that's where some of the bigger, you know, incumbent insurers will go. And then you'll have this cloud of insure techs, you know, who and, you know, uh, and and embedded insurance in other industries that are providing you risk coverage, you know, because they're closer to the point of risk, they can do that. You may end up as an end insured. You, you might you might get your your rental car insurance just in time when you know from somebody that's not the rental car company because you know they're, they're they're pricing it really high, right? But you may have you may have an option for that. You may have an option for uh, you know for some of your home coverage. You may have an option for liability coverage. There's going to be holes in all of that, and and since you've got so many different providers providing all these little micro products, right? You know, there's gaps and there's overlaps. Someone's got to backstop all that. Someone's got to say, okay, but I got you covered no matter what, mm -hmm. right? You go, you go do those things because that's, you know, that's at the point of risk, makes sense. But when those things break down, right, I'm here for you, right? And that's where I think the bigger insurers can really play well, right? I rented a car um, a couple of years ago uh, in Europe, um, Italy, as it happens. Um, you know, I braved the Italian roads <laughs> and... Uh, I got through unscathed mostly except for when I parked my car in a valet garage and they dinged up the car. So I got back to the rental car place. I didn't even know until I got back, right? And I said, yep, you know, dinged up the car, you know, had a long conversation in Italian. I'm trying to get to my flight. We eventually, you know, and I thought I had three different sets of coverage, right? Um, you know, because I had bought it with a credit card that supposedly offered coverage. My, you know, I thought my home insurance, my home auto insurance policy, you know, would in fact cover it. Turns out it does not. Um, you know, I had a, a third set of coverage, I think, through some kind of travel insurance or something. Anyway, I wasn't covered, as it turned out. Well, I was, but technically, the, the ins two insurers kind of pointed at the third one and said it's them. And then they said, well, you know, here's the Byzantine claim process that you're going to go through, <laughs> you know, with multiple phone calls in, in Italian to to try and, you know, resolve this claim. And I ended up just saying to heck with and, and paying the claim, which I'm sure is exactly how the process was designed, right? So. So I thought I had coverage. I had multiple players involved. No one actually covered me. Solving that backstop problem is is going to be a big battleground, I think, for insurance in the future, right? So so the the, the insure techs and and a lot of these smaller micro products, right? And we see them around the world, right? You know, it's you know they've been offering one day auto in Japan for ten years, right? Those sorts of products have a role, but you still have. Uh, a, a bigger set of risk kind of around all that, that someone's going to have to cover. And, and I think that's kind of the future, right? And, and that backstop risk, by the way, that's a lot harder risk for, you know, an internet giant to come in and, and, you yeah. know, and commoditize, right? You know, um, I think of a lot, you know, it's a lot like tra the travel industry, right? You know, when Expedia and Travelocity and those guys all came along, right? Travel agents, you used to call up your travel agent, book a flight, right? And, you know, and they booked the flight and got a 12% commission and, you know, and, you know, it was easier than, you know, whatever you had to do with the airline, the web wasn't there. So, you know, okay, everybody was kind of, you know, fat, dumb, and happy, right? The, the travel industry got upended by all this, and 90% of those travel agents are gone, right? Yeah. But the last 10% are providing that concierge level of service, right? Yeah. And when I booked my honeymoon with my wife, darn well, I paid 450 bucks to that travel agent to go make sure everything was spick and span, and it worked. It was great, <laughs> <laughs> right? They make a very, you know, those top end agents make a good living. And I think that's where insurance may end up, right? A set of micro products and then that kind of kind of big holistic, you know, risk risk experience style backstop coverage. Do you think actually today the traditional insurer can serve um, a Gen Z or millennial, right? You know, they are expecting push button coverage, real time, you know, satisfaction first, and. Um, therefore looking for something which is much more serviceable what's your view um i i think it is possible for insurers to do it but they they've got a ways to go to they don't think quite as they don't move quite as quickly and yeah. they don't always think about the problem quite the same way 
as an insure tech. So, so I had a conversation with a millennial um, <laughs> a colleague of mine's uh, daughter had just taken a job at a large insurance broker and I called her up, congratulated her, said, Hey, if you, you know, need a hand, I know the industry pretty well. And, and we were talking about, and she moved to a new city and she said, and I said, well, we're doing, okay, make sure you got your renter's insurance, right? <laughs> and she goes, Oh, I already got that covered. You know, I did it all online. I said, Oh, really? do tell. I said, okay, lemonade, right? And he goes, she goes, yeah, you know, it's lemonade. It was so easy. That was her comment, right? I think insurers have to make it easy for those entry level sorts of value propositions, right? And and the big battle, you know, between the insure techs and the insure and you know the bigger insurers is, you know, that that colleague, that friend is gonna, you know, her her financial needs are gonna gonna mature, right? You know, she's gonna you know move from renting to to buying a home. She's gonna buy a car, right? She's gonna get married, and, you know, and maybe have kids, right? All those things, you know, create a much more complex financial life. You know, is Lemonade going to scale up fast enough to cover all that, or, or is she going to move to another, you know, to to a bigger insurance company and sort of graduate, so to speak? You know, or do they partner and figure out a transition plan, or does somebody buy somebody? Right? <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll leave out, who, you know, who might buy who. I, I'm a little leery of that last one because I've seen, you know, we 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 did we we've scoured, you know, the the annals of insurance trying to find instances where a big insurer bought an insure tech and and actually got value out at the end of the day. And there's a lot of train wrecks, um, and and not a lot of value being you know created. You know, it tends to be value a little dilutive. So. So I don't think acquisition is is really the way to go. I think it's going to be more partnership um, because I think the insure techs bring that 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 slick interaction and you know that understanding of millennials you know in a way that's very quick uh, you know quickly develops and the insurers can get there. It's going to take them some time um, you know, but but the insurers have a ton of you know a, a ton of risk expertise and you know, a financial position and a regulatory relationship where they, they've got some things to bring to the table too. So, so it ends up being cooperative, I think. Yeah. I mean, when you look at both worlds, so when I interact with insurers and insurtech, it's like, you know, two overlapping circles where the insurer provide, you know, distribution, infrastructure, knowledge, regulation. But then you have this Keo theory where you have to actually appreciate that insurtechs are working as you know entrepreneurs are bringing new ideas and you know looking at disrupting business models and you need to find a way to combine the two and I'm not surprised that most of the acquisitions you've seen are not always very um, effective because when you're actually trying to embed a new into an old environment and you apply the old metrics often it just doesn't work. Yeah, but Sabine, is that is that the old the young people and the old people, or is that the young tech and the old tech, or is it the young interaction model and the old interaction model? Right? You know, it's all about you're right. It's all about really understanding what can be mixed <laughs> as part of the uh, you know new juice yeah. in some ways, and sometimes you know the oil and the milk <laughs> will not mix because they have not been thought through correctly. No, exactly. But I, I will tell you, we've done we've done longitudinal studies over the years. Um, you know, we're one of the one of the few entities doing you know the the multi thousand n you know many country you know consumer studies in insurance. And one of the things we found that's pretty consistent is you know that it, it, the end insurance customer at some point wants to talk to a human when it gets more complicated or when they're buying something new that they haven't bought before, right? You know, when it's a, you know, $200 rental policy, sure, right? You know, you start getting into million dollar life insurance policies, you know, I think you start running into situations where they're gonna want some of that human interaction and some of that more, um, you know, it, it, it's not all gonna be digital, um, you know, it's not all, you know, done with a YouTube video, right? It, it, it's, you know, there's there's an interaction point there where I think the industry, I think the insure techs and the insurance, the incumbent insurers can help each other, right? I, 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 I do think that there's great opportunity for, you know, those sorts of constellations of value to emerge um, because together they are going to be much better than they are separate. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Which takes me to, you know, Another question I have for you around technology and how technology plays uh, in this uh, conundrum, you know, we often talk about data, 
being the oil of um you know everything today you know the gold the oil we we, we mentioned recently maybe renewable energy for our future so how do we handle and harvest data when we actually look at how insurance companies deal with it today you know a lot of historical data but we need new data to make better decisions risk experiences yeah. too well a couple of things right first first off you know the, the broader you know a set of information you can assemble the, the the better and and insurers have a lot of incumbent data internally that they probably have a tough time harvesting because it's all split out on those you know 14 policy administration systems and eight clouds um but there's data that they can get through the interactions that people have with you know, insure techs. There is data that they can exchange with retailers, with auto manufacturers, with utility providers, right? With, um, you know, college uh, ad advice and savings firms, right? 529 plans. There's all kinds of data there. If you can get, if you can negotiate the right trade that makes sense for all the players and makes sense for the customer. Um, one of the findings in our in our upcoming study, um, we we asked a lot of um, and and insured uh, customers in various markets. Like, are you willing? Essentially, are you willing to give up your data? And if so, you know what what's it going to take? And I think I think it's fair to say that mo it was actually a pleasant. I've always thought this, but it's nice to have proof. If you offer someone reasonable risk coverage or reasonable risk advice they understand that to give you good advice and to give you a good you know risk experience and a risk product that they're gonna have to give you some information and they're okay with that they're they're absolutely fine with that hey if you're gonna help me manage my teen driver sure monitor my car i don't care <laughs> right <laughs> sounds great <laughs> you know right whereas if ibm called me up and said we want to monitor your car i would say you know go away right so so I think there's opportunity there, but you've got to be able to form the business relationship first. Then you've got to be able to capture the data. And a lot of these things are edge compute problems, right? They're, they're, they're very large sets of data that are not in your data center and are going to be really expensive to move into your data center or into your cloud because it's on somebody else's cloud. So how do I, you know, how do I run a satellite uh, set of tools? How do I run a, you know, some kind of uh, information extraction, you know, or AI paradigm over there so that I can get the insights back here in my, my, my neck of the woods, right? I've got to connect all that together. And then I've got to figure out how to make decisions that are tailored and insightful for the customer. And I've got to avoid bias, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's an area I think is going to increasingly, you know, get play. We've had some of our largest customers already ask us about this. Um, you know, the AI that is used to figure out what the insights might be, to figure out, you know, that, hey, this particular product might make sense for you at this time, the next best action algorithms. If you're not really careful, you can end up introducing bias that's unintentional and, and um, you know, insurers, you know, had enough problems in the past with redlining and with bias accusations, right? In, in today's environment, people are, are even more concerned about that because we've, you know, in other realms seen, you know, the obvious, you know, negative effects of bias. I think that's going to be an area where, um, you know, using the data correctly is it's, there's great reward and, and I can make a great societal argument for why insurers should do it, but they have to do so responsibly. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a balance point there. Um, you know, my argument for doing it is look, the, you know, we, we've had multiple catastrophes around the world mm -hmm. where the losses were four or five times the insured losses, right? That means our industry has failed in leveraging data to convince people that darn well need insurance and darn well need risk coverage and darn well need to, you know, take actions to reduce their risk. We're not getting to them and we got to get to them. And data is the way to do that. We just have to do it in a way that's responsibly and, and as a fair trade and fair value to the customer. So we covered so many things, but I wondered, you know, for the listener, the viewers, would you be able to give us some examples of a great, you know, relationship maybe with, you know, clients of yours who have done amazing things or client of yours who have been doing amazing thing with 
with insurtechs? Are there examples we can actually leave behind to learn how to do it better? Yeah, I um, um, one of the things that I think we we've, we've seen um, work pretty well is using AI to help um, you know sort of make transactions a little bit smoother and and, and simpler for the end insured. Um, we had a, a client in Japan um, who had a workforce that was very knowledgeable about you know their um, their their life insurance products. Um, and was very knowledgeable about how to help customers, but they were, you know, as, as is happening in many mature art markets, right? The, both the customers and the employees were all getting older and uh, you know, it happened to all of us eventually. And, you know, they were getting to the point where they were just losing so much expertise out the door to retirement that it was becoming really difficult to service, you know, a set of customers who, as they were getting older, right, needed you know, more handholding, more, you know, more patient interaction and discussion, you know, more questions answered. And so we deployed AI as sort of a force multiplier, right? We, we, we said, all right, how do we use, you know, Watson and, and the data that we've got about these customers and the data that we've got about the market, right? To not, not just to automate the process, because while that does add some value, right? You know, a lot of these questions are pretty complicated. But you use it as a way to help coach the folks on the phone and, min and sort of maximize their time on the phone. And, and we've done this, you know, with a life insurer in Japan. We've done this with a credit insurer in the United States, right, where we've used AI to sort of optimize the, the transaction in terms of who's talking to who, right? When the customer calls, do I round them to the person best able to answer their question? Do I round them to the person who is best suited to talk to that style of customer, right? It's a grandmother calling. Right. You, you, you think, geez, um, you know, we, we should have the old person talk to that person. Actually, no. <laughs> a lot of times it's have the young person talk to the old person. Yeah. It, it ends up working out pretty well. Right. The data, the data kind of drives this stuff. But if you use those coaching tools, if you use those matching tools, if you use AI to sort of make sure that the transaction is, you know, informed well and is set up for success in the first place, right? A number of things happen, right? One is your call center can handle a lot more stuff, right? Two, um, your call center actually re it shows reduced turnover because your customer care is, experience overall is better, and you know your your CSRs don't get yelled at quite so much, <laughs> and so they're you know, they're happier. They're talking to people they like, right? You know, it's it, there's a lot of knock on effects where if you use AI to sort of make these transactions a little bit smoother. Mm -hmm take the really simple ones and make them automated, right? We're, we're at a point with our, our customer care, we can, um, uh, you know, the, the metric they use in a call center is containment, right? We can, we can contain 80% of the calls, right? So 80% of them do get handled automatically because the AI is good enough to handle the change of address or, hey, I want to, you know, change my deductible from 500 to 1,000, right? You know, or, or you know, I want to, you know, I, I'm adding this piece of jewelry, right? I mean, the, the, these things are all manageable. And so you're you're concentrating human attention on the stuff that really matters, and then you're helping those humans with the tools to have a really great conversation, and that makes everybody happier mm -hmm. and results in more efficiency and you know a better risk experience. That's wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much for your time. What would be your last words of wisdom for our listeners? Um, you know, stay curious. Uh, stay, uh, you know, informed on things going on outside your industry and outside your line of business and outside your market. You know, listen to great podcasts like Sabine's, but, you know, listen to them, listen to them elsewhere, right? I, I read Ad Week, right? I read a couple of different space publications, right? I read my own, I used to work in defense. I read some of that, you know, economics treatises. I, I, I stay broad because, to build a great risk experience, you have to have that broad experience to, to think about the problem in different ways. If you get hung up on, I've got to automate my existing insurance process, I mean, you know, it's going to get run over five years from now. <laughs> don't, don't spend your time doing that, right? Figure out how to be a great risk partner. And to do that requires a, a very wide range of thought. And, uh, you know, I think, I think if you do that, Right. And then build architecture to match those set of possibilities. Right. Don't architect for today, architect for the five different tomorrows you might create. Right. I, I, you'll be successful and you will 
uh, you know, you will fend off the, you know, the internet competition, you know, if you're in, in sure tech, you know, you will have great interactions and, and opportunities to partner with others. If you're an insurer, you'll have, you know, a way to incorporate the insure techs and you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And, uh, you know, um, you know, and if you're a regulator, you know, you, you'll end up with access to all of this in a way that's relatively seamless and, uh, you know, hopefully free from bias. So, um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, uh, exciting options for everybody as long as we think broadly. Thank you, Mark. So today we meet, met with Mark McLaughlin, IBM Executive, Global Insurance Director, IBM Industry Academy member. Where can we find you, Mark? You can find me on Twitter at MickleMark, M-C-L-M-A-R-K. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at the same address. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, blog, uh, blogs uh, that I do occasionally with some of my IBD colleagues and a uh, big study coming out in November. So uh, if you're, you're listening, uh, keep an eye out for that. Yes, and you will find Mark tweeting with me as well on Twitter and also engaging on LinkedIn. So please. Uh, I just got to try and keep up with you, CB. <laughs> uh, I got a ways to go in the volume department. We're getting there. We're getting there. So appreciate your help on that. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk and uh, we'll put it online. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thanks so much. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine van der Linden. Thank you.